That leads me into Jonathan a bit more. So, so, so for those of you who don't know, he's just been promoted. So I think it deserves a little round of applause for being promoted. Um, he is now the, as you'd expect in Coke, quite an interesting US title, but Senior Vice President of Marketing Communications and Design Excellence. And, and what he's got, gone from is sort of global advertising and content to this role. So he's gone into the heartland. The boy from Leeds has gone into, so he's out of Atlanta. He's really taken the homeland of, of Coke, but in a wider, bigger role, um, which, is, which is fantastic to see. And thank you for coming along tonight. And really what, one of the things he told me earlier on, that when he first started at Coke seven years ago, the CEO actually said to him, Jonathan, Coke is creatively bankrupt. Which I, because let's be honest, well, I always thought, you know, Coke liked to teach the world of seeing that unbelievably fabulous brand as a kid. Yeah, I'm a, as, a, as an agency man, I was always, if I'm being really honest, slightly wary of working with Coke. Yeah, and Jonathan, and this is sparing his blushes, I think over the last five years, what we've seen, Coke is the number one sort of, you know, the biggest brand in the world, now becoming one of the biggest creative brands in the world. I mean, it's a genuine shift in five to seven years, a lot down to him. Um, and that's what he was asked to bring in. And it's quite amazing when you go, with the, the success of, you know, happiness, content 2020, 2013, can marketeer of the year. I could go on and on and on. They really are up there where they should be. As, as a brand that we all look up to and that we can all contribute and participate in in its widest sense of being creative. So um, we're now going to hand over to the, the I'm going to now turn into um, a, a sort of Jonathan Ross um, and we're going to do it as a conversation where I've got a few questions that Jonathan's going to answer with, with some slides. He's going to go through it slightly set up as you'll probably see. Um, but it's a way of sort of bringing it out rather than him just barfing on like I have. And then it's really to open up to you guys to ask him questions. Um, and like any sort of chat show, one of the reasons we're doing this is because he's bringing a book out. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> um, creativity is king. So what we'll do is I think we're going to change the, the slides where we go over there um, and get this, get this moving. I'm going to hand that to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And yeah, I have to say it was a real shock. <laughs> seeing Ian. Ian actually gave me um, uh, my first kind of management break in the industry. I was working at Low Howard Spink and I was running the Vauxhall account. And I, but I didn't particularly like cars. I'd, won, I'd run Audi at BBH and I think once you run Audi, um, then going to run Vauxhall, it was a little bit of a uh, rude awakening. Uh, and um, I wanted to be head of account management and um, uh, they wouldn't let me because Vauxhall was such a big piece of business and the account management department was big. So one of my <coughs> girlfriends actually said to Ian, you know, Jonathan's a bit pissed off at Lowe. Um, he wants to be head of account management. And Ian called me up and said, hey, we've never met, but can you let me take you out for a beer? And we went out for a beer and he offered me the job as head of account management, which was fantastic because it gave him my first management responsibility. So we've worked together and um, uh, known each other for, uh, I think, 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. But when I saw him today with this, this moustache, <laughs> I saw him today with this moustache and I honestly was, it was one of those awkward moments because I was like, oh my God, what the bleep is he doing? And then he said, uh, forgive this, it's Movember. And I was thinking, well, in America, Movember is from the 1st of November through to the end of November, but there is no way that this is 20 days worth of growth. <laughs> so I said to him, I said, well, when did you start? And he goes... First of November. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Uh, um, it broke the ice anyway. And I'm working. I'm now working in, in a wider advertising. I'm working with a load of sportsmen, <laughs> right? And some big butch <laughs> rugby players who come in with a sort of moustache out here, and they laugh at me each, each morning as they go past me. So I'm sort of used to having the piss taken out of me. So thank you, Jonathan, for that. No worries. Uh, yeah. So what we're going to do then? So, as a, as a good chat show host would do, he's got a few questions he's lined up. But then again, do think of your own questions. So uh, this will probably be sort of six or seven or eight questions. And then it's over to you. And if you do want to jump in at any point, please do jump yeah. in um, so it's as interactive as possible. So, right, we've talked about the new job. Yeah, you've gone from agency man to client man. So you've been seven years as client man and probably, right. what, 15 or more years 15, as yeah. agency. Um, 
And, you know, you've been one of the great sort of um, champions of creativity. Um, and as I talked about at Cope, fantastically what you've done in terms Thank of you. helping change Thank that. You. So can, we, can you help us understand your journey, um, really, and how this role has changed your view of creativity? Has it changed at all from client side, from when you were agency side? Yeah, um, uh, one of the uh, things... So what I re and I genuinely would love loads of input, because this is the first time that... I've kind of come out with some of the um, uh, thinking that's going to go into the book. Uh, and um, uh, so there's many, many more kind of chapters that I'm not going to uh, share with you now um, because that could go on for too long. Um, but a lot of the content that I'm sharing with you is actually going to make for content in the book. And I'd love feedback. If there's stuff that you think is bullshit, then tell me that that's bullshit. If there's stuff that you think actually that's really interesting, dig, dig deep. Then I'd like to. I genuinely like to hear that. So um, either in the room or on Twitter or on email, although that's slightly old-fashioned. Um, uh, that I'd really appreciate it. So Ian's right. Uh, 2006, I um, uh, got the job at Coke, and I'd never been a client before, and I was really obviously intimidated. I was intimidated for the first 18 months. Um, uh, but the uh, chairman and chief exec of the company at the time, he did sit me down and he said, look, Jonathan, the Coca-Cola company is creatively bankrupt um, and that is unacceptable. It's unacceptable because it's dragging morale of our people. It's unacceptable because it's dragging down the share price of our company. Our, at the time, we were trading at uh, $29, um, uh, which was an all-time low. Um, uh, we've since been split, but we're trading at about... Uh, $40, which is, you know, 130% increase on where we were seven years ago. And um, uh, he was, um, he basically said that to me because he needed to kind of um, shake me out of my intimidation. Uh, he said, you need to go around the world and you need to inspire our marketers and our agencies to do the best work of their careers on Coca-Cola. And, uh, and so we traveled around the world, and it's me and my team. Um, at the time when I came to Atlanta, um, I had less than seven people in Atlanta working on the team. Now there's about 30 people in Atlanta, and there's about 150 people around the world. And <clears throat> together, we um, uh, just kind of banded together and put creativity as an absolute competitive advantage. And in just seven years, we went from creatively bankrupt to this, which uh, I'm very proud about.
So that was um, uh, just two years' worth of work um, uh, that we put out in 2011, in 2012 to get Creative Marketer of the Year in 2013, uh, and uh, um, uh, created a total of uh, 54 can lions. Um, and, uh, and that's what you can do when you've got a chief exec who says, something's really, really bad, and I'm empowering you to fix it, and then you just harness the great creative talent of everybody inside your organization, but also with our agencies, who are obviously vital to our success. Pretty impressive work, to say the least. Um, the other thing you said when we were in Cannes, I mean, you, you always talk passionately. It's one thing he doesn't talk sort of quietly or sort of boringly. Um, <laughs> he's got a real passion for our industry and creativity. But you've got this particular passion for the distribution of creativity. Mm. Um, you know, not, I think you said something about the, not just the few hairy elite, is it? I seem to remember something like that. Well, I don't know what you mean by that. And what do you mean? So, and this is where it gets a little bit personal, um, and I need to share this with you. Um, because I started in the industry as an account guy, and then um, I got headhunted, not headhunted, poached, a, a direct offer to ultimately become... Um, the group strategy director of Mother London um, and Robert Saville said, look, I want you to come and help us kind of be strategically smarter. Um, uh, and then um, I got over to Coke and it was bizarre because Coke actually saw me as head of creative uh, and I'd never been a creative. Um, but I thought, well, if Coke think that I'm going to be a creative, then I'm going to pretend that I am. <laughs> uh, and, um, and then I started doing some really interesting things and we set up an in-house agency and I lead the in-house creative agency and you know, I go around the world and I want to work with creative um, uh, uh, partners that will let me kind of really genuinely kind of roll around and get dirty in the work. Uh, and I realized that, um, and this is one of the basic principles of um, uh, my book that I'm writing, is that we are all absolutely born creatively. We're born creative equals. There is no such thing as a racist baby and there is no such thing as a non-creative toddler. And the context and conditioning can create racism, or context and condition can knock creativity out of somebody. And um, what was really interesting is when Ian asked me to come along and do this, um, uh, this image, which is actually quite horrendous, and my mom really doesn't like it, um, uh, but it's a piece of art, and it's a piece of art from a photographer who used to work with Hal Henry, this is about uh, 12 years ago, and he was doing a study, and basically his whole entire idea was uh, the uh, combining uh, the youthful face of somebody under six and their old face of somebody over 35. And um, uh, he was a struggling artist, and then about 12 months ago, he became a famous artist, and he had an exhibition in London with all of these big images, and it made the national press and everything. And unbeknownst to me, he was using this image, and one of my friends was in the um, gallery, and he said, bloody hell, Jonathan, that's freaky, I've just seen you. And I'd completely forgotten about it. But actually pulling it out, because it was a fantastic experience at HHCL when I was kind of involved in this art project, um, I find it so uh, important and useful and inspirational to me because creativity lives inside the child of everybody. And there are times when I can't walk into a room as an adult. Because if I walk into a room as a 46-year-old adult that's got all the pressures from Atlanta, everybody's breathing down my neck, everybody's nervous about are we going to get a new big idea, if I walk into a room with a particular creative agency, that's not going to create the environment in which creativity needs to flourish. So sometimes, consciously, I walk into a room like my six-year-old Jonathan. And the six-year-old Jonathan is optimistic and unscared and experimental and has got great um, uh, energy and is curious and is inquiring all the time. And then, of course, there are times when I need to be the 46-year-old experienced guy who can kind of get an agency back on track or, you know, guide an agency when it's faltering. Uh, and I really, really do believe this thing that it's our context that changes who we are. And if everybody was just a little bit more aware of the context that they're in, changing their sense of creativity and creative entitlement and creative empowerment, then I think it would be a good thing for, for us all. And um, uh, uh, certainly at Coke, we're grappling with this distribution of technology, which is enabling the distribution of creativity. And now 80% of all YouTube films that we have on Coca-Cola 
are, um, are created by um, consumers and by students and film school people and stuff, 80%. So just the voice of that 80% is louder than the Coca-Cola company can ever um, uh, have the resources to do. So no longer are we looking for creativity to be led by a single non-collaborative creative advertising agency team uh, who treat everybody else as kind of like less creative or less entitled creatively as, um, uh, as, as they are. Um, if the loudest creative voice of the Coca-Cola brand is consumers, then sure as hell as I'm not going to tolerate, and the company doesn't tolerate, that kind of um, egalitarian approach to creativity that certainly I grew up in. So creativity is absolutely the, it's not the, what we say is, what I say is, it's not the um, remit of few. Creativity is the responsibility and ability of, uh, of us all. Uh, and I think if you can think of consciously about when that inner child kind of wants to come out and when that adult needs to come out um, and kind of uh, flex between the two, then chances are you'll be more creative and feel more confident with your creativity in your work. So that's what I meant about the hairy elite. Nothing wrong with hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll get a few questions on that later on, I'm sure. But um, What about going from creativity to the, sort of what I've been trying to say is commercial creativity? And that article you wrote, in fact, just after Cam, wasn't it? You wrote yes. that article. So, um, you know, the, the idea of, you know, re reaching sort of, I think we called high bar creative with high bar sort of shareholder return. Where does that sit? How does that work? To be honest, it's been instrumental in um, my ability to drive a creative agenda. Um, when I first got to, when I was being interviewed by um, uh, the leadership team at Coke, they said to me, and this is absolutely true, and there's a film, in fact, I'm going to play this film because you'll, you know, then you'll believe me. Can has been an instrumental fuel to my career. I've been coming to Can for uh, nearly two decades now. And um, when I came to Can in the early 90s, I started to appreciate the significance of Advertiser of the Year. 1992, Can Lions introduced the prestigious Advertiser of the Year Award to honor the role of the client at Can. These companies inspire innovative marketing and embrace and encourage the creative work produced by their agencies. And without great clients like these, there is no great work. And as an account guy in an ad agency, I started to uh, question how I'd be able to make the biggest impact on the advertising industry. And each year the momentum that Advertiser of the Year was gaining uh, became more and more significant. And uh, I decided very early on in my career that one day I would be uh, a client and I would be responsible for buying some of the world's most compelling content. And um, I'm so proud to say that five years ago um, I left the advertising industry in one shape and I returned to it in a very different shape and that says Head of Global Advertising at Coke. Um, my ambition would be to uh, succeed in making uh, uh, the Coca-Cola company, Advertiser of the Year, uh, and I think that we're gaining a lot of creative momentum, uh, so that's not a uh, unrealistic ambition, um, but when we do, I, um, I guess it'll be one of the proudest moments of my career. We recorded that at Cannes two years before we actually got the award, um, uh, which, was, which was fantastic. Um, but during my interview, I actually gave that speech to the board of people that were interviewing me, um, and honestly, the drama in the room, because as soon as they said, what would your legacy be? And so I said, well, you know, I'd want us to be creative marketer of the year, at Can or creative advertiser of the year, as it was then called. And you could just tell that I'd lost the job, because they were like, oh, all he cares about is creative awards, we don't want that. And I said, because if you study the last 10 creative advertiser of the year, at the time that they were awarded advertiser of the year, their share price or their sales was an all-time high. Uh, and... Um, and immediately, it was great, because I kind of knew at that time, literally that moment in time, that I'd got the job then, because they were like, oh, he's banging on about creative, but he's also talking about share price. That's interesting. We haven't heard that before. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, my principle is, is this, that magnificent things can happen when the king, the creative agenda, is allowed to rule. 
And just here's just some of the uh, stats. Now, unfortunately, this thing is slightly out of sync, so I'm going to just have to read them to make sure that I get them. But some of the stats that I'd love you guys, and this is all well documented. It's well documented on the CAN site. It's well documented with the IPA effectiveness um, papers, uh, if there have been submissions. Um, but these brands and these advertisers, when they were awarded advertiser year at CAN, enjoyed such significant um, uh, commercial success. So Swatch in 2001, the steepest growth curve on record ever in its history. Nike, just after 9-11, um, uh, delivered a 14% increase in earnings per share. Phil Knight called Advertiser Year a defining moment um, uh, in that brand's history given the economic and political challenges um, that followed 9-11. Uh, BMW in 2003, uh, BMW Films, um, uh, they uh, helped generate a 10% and 16% rise in sales and in stock price um, respectively. And then in 2004, you had Sony. And during this year, Sony uh, was awarded Advertiser of the Year. At the same year that PlayStation became the world's biggest selling console game, with 100 million units shipped in the previous 12 months. And most of the awards were actually for um, the Sony PlayStation. Then we have uh, 2005, I think uh, the uh, uh, sync is out. Yeah, 2005, uh, Honda was Advertiser of the Year. This is incredible. Honda was, um, had a share price high of uh, $38.50, um, uh, but a UK sales increase, and majority of the creative work that was awarded at Cannes was from the UK with the beautiful stuff from Wyden Kennedy. A UK sales increase of 28%, and it's a car. I mean, this is not an impulse category, so 28% for a car manufacturer was just incredible. And then we had Adidas the year later, um, and Adidas enjoyed a record market cap, so much so that its share price became uh, undesirable uh, a, pr a price position for uh, potential investors. And so they went through a share price split at four to one, um, but record market cap in 2006. And that's when I stopped because that was the research that I did for this meeting with the board. I stopped at 2006 because it was in 2006 that I got the job. What's happened since then? Volkswagen. Uh, its most prolific year of creativity also led to its most um, uh, profitable uh, period of share price growth, uh, an 89% increase in share price. And again, that's at the t height of the financial crisis. Uh, so that's pretty impressive. And then 2008, we've got uh, P&G, uh, share price high of $75, beating the S&P. Um, and then Unilever came along. Unilever at a time of um, upward trajectory share price. Uh, uh, IKEA, a private company, so financial data on IKEA is slightly more challenging uh, to get, but net profit was up by 10%, and like for like sales um, uh, was up by um, uh, uh, 13%. So, really, really incredible growth. And then we have Mars. Um, Mars um, uh, increased its revenue by $3 billion, but it's a privately held company, so financial data difficult to come by. Um, uh, so that is an estimate. And then we have Coca-Cola. And by the time we were awarded Advertiser Year, um, uh, we, our share price was also at an all-time high. <coughs> and uh, our level of brand love, consumer engagement for the Coca-Cola brand was at an all-time high. So if you ever need a set of bulletproof data that you can use to your clients or to each other uh, about creativity being a fantastic competitive advantage and a competitive, a fantastic shareholder um, uh, uh, driver, shareholder, shareholder value driver, uh, then um, uh, just look at the IPA and look at CAN. There is fantastic, fantastic evidence uh, that creativity and commercial success do go hand in hand. That's what we're trying to do here. because it, it frustrates the hell out of all of us, the, having to get that message across you know, not to CMOs, but to the board. But they, they how, was that, was that easy to convince them of that? Did they, did they buy that? Well, I, I used the data and all the time, every time I ever got on a podium or ever briefed an agency or stood in front of somebody that I needed their approval of the creative work, I said, the reason why we're here, all of us are here to add value to the Coca-Cola share price. And, um, and I used to use these references, so as a, exactly the way that creativity added value to Nike and added value to Volkswagen and added value. So I always start, even the most 
when I'm trying to be the most inspirational on my creativity, I always start, even with an agency briefing, I always start with the um, uh, financial argument, the commercial argument for creativity, because uh, I think it just legitimizes bravery. But because the, the CFO, one of the things I always find, the IPA effect in these papers, is the one thing that a CEO or CFO properly look at. Yeah? Absolutely, absolutely. Because it is really data rich and it's really, yeah, because some other things just convince the CMO. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But you were talking to the you were talking to the wider board when you yeah, were doing that. To totally, and and without question, the um, evidence in IPA effectiveness papers, the commercial you can't win an IPA effectiveness paper if you don't have a rock solid commercial argument. So um, they were in essential schooling for me as I kind of stepped into uh, this role. Okay, so th that's commercial creativity then. So because I've obviously seen parts of his the chapters of his book, there's one term he uses which I think you better explain. Um, which is he talks about the rise and rise of creative destruction. Which sort of seems a bit of a weird concept. Um, do you want to explain that one? Yeah, I, um, I, I, I think this sits squarely with um, uh, uh, ADAPT. And that's why when Ian first called me, or Skyped me, uh, and said, look, this is my thing, what do you think about it, and what do you get involved? I was like, oh, absolutely, because... That's what I'm trying to instill across the Coca-Cola company network. I mean, we're in 207 markets and work with far too many agencies, but, you know, um, across all categories, over 2,000 agencies. Um, and the thing is, when we start to replicate, or think that replicating what we did last year is a recipe for success next year, it's, it's the complete recipe for disaster. And so to educate the industry and our agencies that we shouldn't be codifying everything and we shouldn't be looking backwards, we need to look forwards. Um, and that actually for new success to be born, we have to kind of kill old things. We have to stop old processes. Um, uh, this idea that, you know, the king is dead, so long live the king. That's what we did last year, so what are we gonna do this year? Is really, really, really important to me. Uh, and the next case I wanna share with you is, gets into this kind of like debate about is TV dead? Um, and my point of view on TV is, if you treat TV like you treat it, uh, treated it um, 10 years ago, then yeah, TV is gonna create a diminishing return on your investment. But if you treat it like a new opportunity to create deeper and richer um, uh, consumer experiences, <coughs> then my goodness, you can do amazing, amazing things through technology and really, really position your brand in quite an interesting way. So a lot of people say to me, uh, is TV dead? And I say, yeah, TV is dead, but long live TV, because when you can work with TV like this, um, then it can become really interesting. Well, hello, is this thing on? Is anybody listening? In Hong Kong, Coca-Cola was launching a regional TV scene, and our task was to stay true to the film whilst getting every team in town to see it and buzz about it. How could we get this one spot to excite them on a whole new level, like this? Meaning rapid motion is the latest slang word used by Hong Kong teens. We created an iPhone app where teens could catch the tumbling bottle caps from the TVC to win instant prizes. Step 1. Download the app. Step 2. Wait for the TVC to air at 10pm each night. Step 3. Chop or swing your phone to catch instant prizes straight from the screen. Talk, 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 talk. Every chop talk, talk, could talk, instantly talk, win you discounts, mobile games, and other exclusive virtual collectibles. We turned an otherwise traditional TV ad into Hong Kong's and Coca-Cola's first ever interactive TV gaming promotion. And we also ran the ads in cinemas and outdoor. Then, once the teens got smart to how it worked, they posted the spot on YouTube talk, talk, and played it talk, all day long, talk, 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 giving our activity talk, 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 a truly talk, viral talk, 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 Even talk, audiences talk, talk, overseas talk, 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 shouted about us on YouTube. Results. After just one day, the app hit the number one download spot on the local app store. And after one month, it had already been downloaded over 380,000 times. Never before had a branded promotional app gained such a high ranking. And the ad's viewing figures were even more astounding. To date, it has been watched fanatically over 9 million times on TV, YouTube, and Weibo. 
That's 1.28 times for every man, woman, child, and teen in Hong Kong. We've created the most successful Hong Kong Coke promotion and TVC in 35 years, opening happiness to new heights. Talk, 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 talk. Um, that one has several uh, can lines in 2012, uh, but I think it's a great um, uh, uh, body of evidence that you know when McCann. Hong Kong were given the TVC, they were like, well, let's not just run the TVC and do some posters point me at it. What can we do to completely reimagine the TV experience? Um, and that's still our benchmark of um, uh, fusing technology and old media and deeper, more rich human experiences uh, into our creative work. Which is, which is a good example of what I mean by diversification, I suppose, is just sort of taking traditional things and, and widening it in fact, it's quite interesting. That's where I started. That was a sales promotion mm. on a mm. TV. But just, it shows that humans don't change, but technology, yeah, yeah. technology does, really. Yeah. So it's the yeah. same insight, same thinking, but you're totally. um, just different technologies. And that's what we're all embracing. Um, but on from that and the wider thought of diversification, I mentioned it before, Content 2020. I mean, it's two years ago at Cannes. You, I mean, it was quite a thing. I remember it sort of, so Coke are posting their strategy on YouTube and they're gonna share it? God, that felt that felt like that so uncoke. It felt yeah. it felt a very new so so would so gone, why do you do it and what have you learned from it and how you know how's that engaged the creative community? <clears throat> so it was a really interesting experience because I was presenting this at at um, uh, Cannes on the stage. And as ever at a um, Coke presentation at Cannes, you've got half of the room uh, at the front, all Coke execs, so about 25 Coke execs, we're all wearing Content 2020 t-shirts, yeah, giving us the you know, kind of support. And then you have about 20 Pepsi execs, and the Pepsi execs have all got the notebooks out and the cameras and everything. And uh, <coughs> we'd kind of kept everything under wraps. There were only about five people who saw Content 2020. Um, uh, on uh, bef be beforehand, and as I was narrating Content 2020, it was just fantastic because I was looking at the Coke guys, and they were just getting bigger and bigger and bigger as they were getting more and more proud. It's like, yeah, that's what we want to do. That's what we want to do. And the Pepsi guys were just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And then as soon as we came off stage, and this is with my CMO, um, uh, uh, so the head head person <coughs> responsible for global marketing, and we were in press conference, and the first thing is like. Pepsi were in the audience. What are you doing, given them all your thoughtware? And um, uh, my uh, CMO said, well, not only did we give them the thoughtware in that presentation, but we've posted it on YouTube now so they can download it and they can keep it. And, uh, and it really did surprise all of the media, but my CMO was brilliant because he said, look, Pepsi might have our thoughtware, but they don't have our brands and they don't have our people. And it's the combination of thoughtware, brands, and people that create the Coca-Cola company success. Uh, and uh, what you don't want to be is just taking that thought and trying to apply it to your own brands because then you'd be seen as a, as a me too. Um, and if there is ever <coughs> an example that you should use about transparency and the value of being generous and giving away stuff, since that, uh, um, uh, well, from, just from a purely kind of creative perspective, uh, the year we gave it away, we won 12 Lions. The year later, we won 31 Lions, including two Grand Prix. Because the industry, the creative industry, the mobile industry, the uh, design industry, were just like, well, if that's Coke's benchmark, we're going to leap over it. So it became a Trojan horse to some of the more conservative business units in our system. Um, uh, so huge, huge creative impact of that. Um, but the, uh, uh, the other area, which I hadn't anticipated, is how much shared value you get when you're seen to be generous. So um, we've had fantastic shared value exchange with the Harvard Business School. <coughs> so we went in and we taught Content 2020 to their faculty. And they're writing case stories about us. Our relationship with Harvard Business School has never been closer. Um, same with Stanford University. We went to Stanford, shared it with their faculty. They gave us free executive education. P&G, we went and did a workshop with P&G and then they did a workshop back with us on shopper marketing. Walmart and McDonald's, all of these clients that are genuinely interested in the, how we're going about um, uh, uh, content creation, um, uh, we've leveraged 
our generosity to get a much better value share um, uh, from some significant partners are old and new. So uh, it truly is a fantastic case. And when you give stuff away, you'd be surprised at quite how much richer you become as an organization um, because of the generosity of other, uh, other people who are just wanting to partner with you on, on uh, a particular creative journey. Because uh, the, the, the C word, the content word, is the sort of the big word, you know, the... Uh, just, just what, what's your description of content? Just, what, what, just how would you sum it up? <coughs> I think content becomes really the uh, substance or matter of brand engagement and brand conversation. Uh, and so if any, anything that can allow a consumer to engage with your brand or converse about your brand becomes content. So content is really, really, really um, uh, vast and wide. Uh, and content should be the wrapping around everything. Incl the one area that we haven't yet kind of figured out the relationship of, we understand the relationship between advertising and content, and design and content, and packaging and content, and sales promotion and content. We understand that relationship. The one area where we're still kind of figuring out what's the credible um, uh, kind of um, uh, positioning is content and experiences. Um, and, and, and finding a way that, I mean, both are absolutely kind of bedfellows, but finding an articulation of a relationship between the two is something that we're still working on. Okay, and then, because then, it's quite interesting in this sort of, in this brave new world of from advertising to content, this whole, you know, we have creative directors and you know what? What does that? What does that mean for leadership skills for creative directors going into this diversified world, this more agile world? Well, you know, I really, I didn't realise this. A lot of the creative directors that I worked with were brilliant, but they're also pains in the ass because they didn't kind of know how to treat human beings. And um, uh, and and then I started working with lots of creative directors, and the first thing that you know, I'd go out for a drink with my first new creative director in South Africa or in Japan or in China. And invariably, we'd be having a drink, it'd be one-on-one, -on -one and they were going, it's so, so difficult being a creative director, because what do I know about managing all of these people? A bunch of entitled, emotional people that are in my office all the time, kind of whingy, and I don't know how to manage it. And I thought, God, you know, it's really interesting, because in business, there are so many business books about leadership. Um, uh, and in government, there are so many references about leadership. But in the creative industries, there's not a lot. And so one of the things that I'm kicking around is um, uh, what does creative leadership um, uh, look like? And so there's a chapter called, you know, congratulations, you've now just been crowned king or queen, uh, so now what? And I will always reference this film first. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Now, I use that film all the time when I'm briefing any group of um, uh, creators. And I mean creators in the widest sense. I also use that film every time I'm in front of an audience like you. Um, because, um, first of all, I feel very grateful that you've given me and the Coca-Cola company your time. Um, but if you're interested in creativity, then that film should be speaking to you. Um, uh, I do sometimes see my creative partners as troublemakers. And I do sometimes see my partners as restless with the status quo. But the reason why I l love them or what I look for is, do they think that they can change the world with me? Because if they believe that they can change the world, if you all believe that you can just change the world, and when I talk about the world, the world could just be your world, or it could be your company's world, or it could be your client's world, or it could be when the client's world gets changed, the world, um, uh, uh, then if you believe it, 
then I want to see that belief because perhaps then we can do uh, outstanding magic together. And, you know, I think it's, it's, such, it's such a flattering notion to be restless with the status quo and a flattering notion to think that you can change the world. Um, and that's what I look for in creative people. And it doesn't matter if they're creative students that are fresh out of school or they're great creative directors that have got truckloads of awards and truckload of in industry recognition. Um, uh, you can kind of sense when people genuinely think that they can still change the world. So anyway, nine principles of uh, creative leadership. Uh, for me, it's about you know, being soulful, um, uh, amplifying the creativity in everybody, distorting reality, being relentlessly optimistic, a culture of curiosity, giving away credit, inspiring risk, being courageous, <coughs> and celebrating both failure and success. So just a little bit more on those. You know, brilliant creative directors become the soul of a company or become the soul of a brand that they lead. Uh, and um, uh, it's such a responsibility to be that soul. If you're in a privileged position of being a creative director on a brand, then you need to understand that brand instinctively, intuitively, better than anybody else. And likewise with your um, company, there are poisonous and toxic creative directors. And I don't know if, that's, uh, if a company should indulge that um, because they impact the uh, culture in such a, um, uh, a, a profound way. So I think when you're managing creatives, think, you know, do they have a right to be the soul of this company? If they don't have a right to be the soul of the company, then the chances are they're not going to be worth um, uh, the maintenance. So this idea that they're the soul of a brand is really, really important. Great creative directors amplify the creativity in everyone they work with. Great creative directors um, are able to bring out the creative genius and bring out the child. Uh, client and agency folk um, uh, uh, together. Great creative directors distort reality and make the impossible uh, seem possible. It's really interesting. I went on an uh, executive leadership program with the Coca-Cola company. I had to do this EQ thing. Um, uh, and um, uh, it was like you know, three hours worth of answering these questions. And then we all got public feedback. And they were challenged by me because they said, Jonathan, you live up in the clouds. And as an executive at the Coca-Cola company, you've got to have a grasp on reality. And I'm like, if I stay down here, down in reality with everybody else, all the other execs at the Coca-Cola company, we're never going to do creative genius. Uh, and you know, what I need is I don't want to ground my agencies in the reality of dealing with our customers and our retailers and our headwinds every day. I want to push my creatives into you know, a position of absolute impossible. Uh, and it was really interesting. They were like, this is emotional intelligence, and they're telling me that I've got the wrong profile to be an executive leader. But it's because the, prof the um, uh, pool, the norms, were not based on creative folk. Um, and I have to distort reality, and my great creative partners are the ones who allow me <coughs> to distort reality. Creative directors are relentlessly optimistic and exude uh, positive and infectious energy. Uh, and I won't name names of the brilliant creative um, partners that I have around the world, but uh, uh, the ones that are really, really close to me are the ones who can just like, I've got a problem, and they go, fuck yeah, we can sort this out. Brilliant, relentless optimism. Uh, creative directors, increasingly important in today's collaborative world. Uh, creative directors, brilliant creative directors, um, establish trust in the eyes of their team and in the eyes of um, uh, their partners by giving away credit. If um, a junior person has come up with a blinding idea, then give away the credit um, uh, and uh, watch your people around you grow as a result of their increasing trust. Great creative directors um, have the courage to make unpopular calls, to do the right thing by the work. Um, and um, I, know, I know when I get, I'm on the phone or I'm on Skype or I'm on a video conference and, you know, they, the agency has to make a call that is going to make me feel uncomfortable because of finance or time or of an agreed approach to something. Um, uh, but the strongest of creative directors are the ones that do make the right call for the work and make it easy for me to understand, make it easy for all of the stakeholders to understand why they're making this call for the benefit of the work. Uh, courage is so important. And great creative directors um, create a culture of curiosity. They never stop asking questions and learning. The most talented creative directors uh, are the ones that will be asking the most questions, particularly at a time of brief. 
uh, and they're confident to ask questions as a child is confident in asking questions. Why, why, why? Um, so, so important, particularly in briefings. And then finally, I think it's finally, uh, they inspire risk uh, and all that that entails. Um, uh, really helping clients understand the calculations around the risks uh, is really, really important. I think this is, yes. So, um, uh, celebrate both failure and success. So we've taken a risk, it fails, we have a bit of a celebration around the failure as well as the success. Uh, and so just in summary, it's about the soul, it's about amplifying the creativity in everybody that you work with. It's about distorting reality and making the impossible seem possible. It's about relentlessly um, uh, optimistic. It's about instilling a culture of curiosity, not having all the answers, but having the best questions. It's about giving away credit to those all around you, inside and outside of the agency. It's about inspiring risk. It's about being um, courageous, and it's about celebrating both failure and success. So they're going to be like the kind of leadership um, uh, chapter headings um, uh, in the uh, writing that I'm doing right now. Any creative directors in the room? So, you know, I'll be interested in what your comments are on that when we... Yeah. Um, <clears throat> no, one, one or two more questions and over to you. I sort of, he's creative marketeer of the year. He's won all these canned lions. What's your, what is your favourite? What is your favourite piece of content, I'll call it, that, um, that you want to share? Um, I, I will always hold this up until I get something that's equally brave. If anybody's got an, any ideas, let me have them. Um, uh, but uh, this next piece is really the jewel in our crown um, uh, because when Leo Burnett came to us and said India and Pakistan it's terrible how both governments are failing the people of India and Pakistan and we think Coke could do something really really small that could create a really big conversation uh, between these two warring nations um, uh, and they've been at war with each other for um, over 60 years over a piece of um, land called Kashmir and you can't understand it unless you've been there, but families have just been segregated. So you might have an aunt and a, uh, an uncle or a brother um, or a daughter in a, um, uh, a country, but you can't see them because of the uh, uh, intransigence between the um, two political parties. Um, uh, and so we did this, and it was incredibly, it was, it was just such an incredible gift by Leo Burnett. Um, and I think it, we, it won us uh, nine Ken Lions this year, so from an awards perspective, but I'm more interested in what it's done to the cultural discourse in India and Pakistan. The relationship between India and Pakistan is one that has seen a lot of lows. It's stressful, it's tense. It seems it's not improving and it's getting worse. It's only been 60 years that we have been apart. Before that, we were living harmoniously together. I think all the strife would go away if you took away the barbed wires in the middle of the two countries. It saddens me that we have this neighbor that we can't even go visit. They have this perception which they ingrained in the head that that's the bad guy. But when they actually meet them, they realize, you know what, you're just like me. Mainly because there's no communication. They're near us, but we have no access to them. And it's sad, because together I think we would do wonders.
creating an environment where young people can exchange ideas, thoughts, gestures, and take away that communication gap that exists. If I have any opportunity to go to India, I'll surely go there. The whole idea of actually touching hands, it's like communicating with each other without words. And that action speaks louder than anything else. This is what we're supposed to do, right? We are going to take minor steps so that we are going to solve bigger issues. It is more about, you know, how similar we are as opposed to how different we are. Togetherness, humanity, this is what we want. More and more exchange. Fabulous. Well, one last question on that. They, so, if that's a fantastic bit of creativity, did that commercially, did that work? Well, we have two um, uh, views on um, kind of short-term and long-term uh, equities that we're driving. Uh, I truly don't believe that that made people run out in India, Pakistan, or in America or the UK and, and pick up a Coke. I don't believe that. Um, but I do believe that it made everybody feel much better about Coke and understand Coke's place in society. And then the next time that they're in front of a cooler, then chances are uh, the recency of that type of message um, uh, will um, uh, unconsciously persuade them um, uh, to choose Coke. And, and, just, just, and how would, just going back to the full circle on commercial creativity, how it works for Coke, mm -hmm. for example, someone like Leah Burnett's then, just as an agency, how they would get commercially rewarded for their creativity I know you have the sort of value-based compensation model, but yes. I just think that's quite an interesting one, going back to the, the P of adapt. Yeah. How, because again, you've been quite forward-thinking in that. So just t touch on that, then I'll, then I'll hand over to Q questions from the floor. Well, what we wanted to do is um, uh, we wanted to uh, create a model where we could literally value, um, put a value framework around the cost of a particular project. Uh, and if an agency uh, succeeded and the work was well received, the work got um, uh, picked up by our markets uh, and uh, tested well, uh, then an agency can earn up to 30% margin on a particular project. Um, and 30% margin in the industry is really quite incredible. Um, uh, and so I'm very um, pleased that because of our creative momentum recently, uh, over the last three or four years, at the same time as we've introduced value-based compensation, agencies have been able to earn greater margin because of the financial model that we've got. The thing that is um, uh, absolutely at risk is any margin at all for an agency if the work that we create together um, performs badly. Uh, so an agency could lose all of their margin entitlement if the work is bad. Um, so we're sharing the risk um, uh, uh, with the industry. Uh, but we're doubling the reward um, if they deliver work that is as excellent as um, the work that you've seen today. 